what we should do is, okay, so there's a 30 second lag. Um, so me and you don't wanna have our bug world audio on. And actually like, I would suggest like maybe don't even open bug world because it might slow you down a bit. Um, but what I'm gonna do is before, um, okay, cool, it's streaming. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cancel this now. Let me just make sure. Oh wait, hold on. Even open bug world because it might slow you down. Okay, sick. It's working. Um so I guess we can just stay here. Um but what was I saying? I guess like before the last question, I'll tell people to ask any questions. Um, and they can type it in the chat and then we can take like a couple questions. Awesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, whatever, you know how to talk about your work. So yeah, yeah, I think so. Right. I, I, think I, do until I personally don't know how to talk about my work, but you seem to have a, a grasp of it. <laughs> oh. Um, oh my gosh, well, I'm going to take a screenshot of bug world. It looks so cute. Yeah, all my friends who've gone and seen, they're like, this is dope. This is dope. And it is. It's really amazing. Thank you. Yeah, it's been really fun. I need to start, like, um, reaching out to people for funding so that I can put on my next show. Because, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, I didn't really, like, ask for funding because it only materialized in the first, in the few days before the show. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so... But now you have, you know. Yeah, now I, because I, I, I was kind of being like, I swear it's really cool. Like you should, you should definitely pay for this. But it's like I had no proof, and now I can be like, look, it actually is really cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I have like programming scheduled out until like um, the end of May, which is awesome. That's amazing. Yeah, I have, I have like one day to fill. But anyway, how have you been? I've been good. Had a crazy day at work. You know how work goes. It's crazy. Oh, sorry, you cut out for a second. Oh no, just had a crazy work day. So you know how it goes. Work is crazy. Um, you're cutting in and out a little bit. Oh no. Um, do I need to just speak louder, or is it? No, now it's working well. You just like froze for a second, but it came back. So if that happens, it's like I, I think it's fine. Um, we'll just okay. redo it. But anyway, you were saying work's been a little crazy. Yeah, just today. I had to go um, deinstall some work for my boss and um, mm. are you a Are you a um, art handler? I am an assistant, an artist assistant. And my oh, boss had uh, some work in an exhibition. And I needed to go pick it up for him, deinstall it. Word. Who, who do you no, assist for? Right. Uh, his name's Carl Dialvia. Uh, Carl, Carl who? Dialvia. He's a sculptor. Um, okay. Based out of like Western Connecticut. Shows with Hesse Flato in Chelsea. Um, he's a great guy. Really love working for him. Very kind. Very generous. Willing to teach me things. Nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. We have one person in here. So I figure... Um, is is that you on there or is that like a stream? That is not me. I did not sign Well, on. we're live streaming, so people are hearing us. Hey, guys. What's up? <laughs> What's up? We're going to wait <laughs> for some more people to come in. Oh, also, Francesco, I think maybe we can start with like us like asking people to walk over and see your work. Hey, guys, yeah. if you haven't seen the show yet, go to the museum and check out Francesco's work. His is the one. Uh, with the paintings and the hanging tapestries. So go over there now. I'll lead you guys. Follow me. Um, but yeah, I figure we'll wait um, probably to like 8.05 or something. I mean, I couldn't, should I end the broadcast and just like start anew? I don't think so. What do you think? Um, Whatever you want to. Yeah, let's just wait here. Um, I'm gonna go be in the in your painting room. 
but yeah, I figure when there's more people, I'll tell people we can all like walk through the museum together. <laughs> um, also, when I started, I was um, telling people to join from Instagram Live, which was mm -hmm. really great, but I've been banned. So, oh, why? Um, you know, it's crazy because I've been. So they were saying it's like for quote unquote like harassment and bullying, but I'm like most certainly not harassing or bullying anybody. Like <laughs> there was this one meme that was of SpongeBob, you know, when like he has like that little cowboy hat on and he's like around the world, like, you know, yeah. or like yeah. around town, I think. Um, I posted that and it said like MFers in 1997 when around the world came on and that was deleted. And then... <laughs> And it said harassment and bullying. And I was like, hey, I don't think this is harassment and bullying. They're like, no, 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 this is harassment and bullying. And then another thing that happened was um, um, I posted a, a screenshot of a tweet that was like, hey, babe, are you okay? We drove past cows and you didn't say cows. And that was reported for harassment and bullying. Or it wasn't reported, but it was taken down. So now I'm banned, but I don't know. Okay, I'm going to go live on. That's weird. I know it's really it's really frustrating, especially because like this is linked to it and stuff. Um, and that's how I get people to pay attention to my lovely artists. OK, I'm going to go live on the backup just to try to get some people to show up. Um, but. Around the world, around the world, around the world. Hey, guys. You, um, here I am, I'm back to tell you, um, to go to the link in my bio. We're having an artist talk in the virtual world I made with Francesco, who is one of the painters in the show. So get off of here and go to the link in my bio. I'm actually streaming on there right now. So if you log on now in two seconds, you're gonna hear me say it there. So yeah, go to the link in my bio. Francesco is an amazing artist. And if you click spacebar, you can jump. Okay, bye. Go there. Go to the link in my bio. Thank you. We're live streaming. Bye. Oh my God, somebody's named Tiffany Trump 420. That's so funny. <laughs> are there frogs? Um, I don't think there are frogs, but I can change that. If you go there now, I'll upload a, a frog. Upload a frog? What do you mean upload a frog? <laughs> you wouldn't download a frog. <laughs> <laughs> can you like put frogs in your world like i could find like a picture of a frog and um and and like put it up there so something i've been kind of thinking of um hi friends six people here um okay i'm gonna go live on my name real quick um but what was i saying i spaced out yeah. oh yeah I, I kind of been thinking of like hiding more Easter eggs and like eventually doing like a scavenger hunt. That would um, be dope. Right? Yeah. And like, but it could be like a scavenger hunt with like the work that's already in there. So like find a work that like represents this, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> um, that could be really cool. Yeah. I'm excited about it. Hey. Something I like hey, doing guys. is going on your trampoline and jumping onto the roof. Right? It's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, I'm just here again to tell you to log on to Bug World right now to see an artist talk. So go to the link in my bio right now. We're live streaming. Francesco's having his artist talk. Um, you love me from Athens, Georgia. Thanks. I love you too. Um, but yeah, go to the link in my bio now. We're, we're starting at 8 p.m. We're having an artist talk. So please go to that. Look at the chandelier. Beautiful. Okay, bye. Um, <laughs> um, I I like truly hate uh, live streaming. It makes me deeply uncomfortable. Hey guys, we're gonna start in two minutes. Um, word. Anyway, so you've had a hectic day. Yeah, kind of, but not bad. I went to the doctor for the first time in like three years today. Um, 
how that everything's fine so i didn't even need to go (laughs) that's good you know uh, health insurance for me is on on the to-do list oh my god well i'm on medicaid right now which is awesome and that's why i'm like taking advantage and going to like I'm going to go to the physical therapist. I'm going to go to gastroenterologist. <laughs> um, but yeah, because I'll, I'll probably lose my health insurance when I move. So, you know. Okay. All right. Some more people are rolling in. Let's wait another. Um, let's wait another three minutes or so. Hi, guys. Um, so, guys who are already here, just so you know, there's like, if you're on your... Um, laptop you can uh or desktop you can go into the chat and at the end we'll have room for questions so towards the end type them because we can't scroll up can't scroll up um but yeah anyway i'm really excited this is our first artist talk i'm also very excited I feel like um like a knot in my stomach. This is like it's like part public speaking, but also like being extremely online. So some mm-hmm. there's like a middle ground there somewhere. Yeah. I, right. I think it's helping me that I can't see like the bug world. Yeah. I know it. <laughs> like right now it's just it's me and you. Right. Now, is, yeah. <laughs> just me and you, baby. Um so yeah, to everybody in bug world right now, uh we're using like a third party for live streaming. So right now it just looks like me and Francesco on like on a zoom call. Um, okay guys. So everybody who's here already, um, let's walk over to the museum. Um, and, um, look at some of his work. We'll just, and I'll also have it on a slideshow, but all right, people who are coming in, we're walking to the museum to look at Francesco's work. Follow me babes. It's me, Adele. Um, all right. So if you come to the museum, I'm waiting for people to follow me. There's a 30 second lag, so it's like a little, um, yeah, like a lag. <laughs> um, all right, I'm just gonna be in the painting room until 8.03 and then I come to the museum. Um, I think like me having this virtual world makes me seem like I'm way more tech savvy than I am, <laughs> but I'm not. Um, all right. I'm gonna go back to the stage now. All right. So let's start. Um, Francesco, hi. Hey. <laughs> thank you so much for being here, and thank you so much for participating in the show. I really thank appreciate you for it. having me. Thank you for including me. It's been a great experience. It was a no-brainer. Your work is incredible. Um, so let's start off. Why don't you just tell me um, a little bit about your the work that's shown in Bug World right now? Yeah. So I think that the the constant through all this work that's shown right now, and throughout my whole practice, even outside of what's on um, on display here, is the fantastical. Mm-hmm. Um, that that stays in the work regardless of my subject matter um you know and i think what where that comes from is you know uh, when when i'm not making when i'm not spending time in my studio i'm kind of immersing myself in a book or a video game or dungeons and dragons um and all of those things you know exist in this fantasy realm and that's like my form of escapism and you know, that's, that's my comfort zone since I was like a kid. Right. And, um, this is kind of how I merge my hobbies with my practice and my career. Um, I think 
something else uh, that frequently comes into my work is like reflecting on societal constructs, um, you know, constructs of identity and um, how even in these like fictitious worlds, um, they uphold and reinforce colonialism and uh, the patriarchy, imperialism, capitalism. Um, it's like we go to these places designed for us to escape and we can't even really escape, right? It's still just like kind of echoed throughout this in the undertones and whatnot. So I think I think that would be a way to like kind of summarize and what's consistent through the work, um, okay. whether it's the drawings or the paintings or the masks. Um, yeah. Okay, hell yeah. And so tell me about your process. You're working with sculpture and painting and physical drawings. And how do these inform each other and inform like the themes that you just brought up? Yeah. Um, so there isn't really like, everything kind of starts off as a drawing, whether mm -hmm. it's pen and paper or digital. Um, and I've been making like the digital drawings for a few years now. Um, and it, that's primarily where it starts. Um, <clears throat> typically they mostly act as like a blueprint um, where I take the time to figure out like the formal aspects of the work. Um, and then like from there, like once, you know, the digital work's done, I move on to like the painting, right? And the digital work has allowed me to figure out my formal issues. And then when I get to the painting process, I'm allowed to just like focus on how to make this a painting, how to make it work as a painting, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's kind of how I use that. I, I feel secure once I like make the drawings, digital or not like i know this works as an image i know this is working as a drawing and then i just figure out how to make it work as a painting and um, so the 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 drawings that are in the museum now do you, like do you see these as like uh like will they eventually be paintings and um i think so i'm also i'm been looking into like getting them printed as tapestries after seeing them like this like that I would like, i would love to see them as like these transparent tapestries existing in a space on like silk or something i don't know like i i could see it in my head i just have to figure out how to do it like i think something that's like important in my practice is that like i view everything as a tool right mm -hmm. if i'm dealing painting is a tool for me the the drawings are a tool the masks are a tool the figure is a tool and what's important for me is the conversations that happen within like around the work and that the work spurs and some people get like really hung up on like I am a painter and I need to make paintings and like painting is eh. <laughs> or like you know sculptures all I do or whatever whatever and all of that is like a means for an end to me like I think there's value in all of it and I take it serious when I do it and I really investigate the medium but it, it it's a means to an end. Uh, well, I'm, I'm really interested in that because I think so many times we think that something can't belong on a wall until it's uh, completed. But oftentimes, like, I find that, like, the different iterations leading up to the final product can, um, are, are, like, can really hold up and be their own thing entirely before they become something else. So that's exciting. Um, yeah. And tell me a little bit about sculpture. When did you start working with the masks? Um, I mean, I know because you represent masks in the drawings as well. So it seems like, you know, like an easy leap to make. But um, t yeah, tell me a little bit about the masks and the use of masks. So for me, the masks are less than a year old. They're very new for me and I'm very excited about them. I'm glad my work has like gone in this direction. And, you know, I see myself moving towards performance and like installation and things like that, you know, and, um, and I think for me, the, the masks are able to like bring in that, the fantasy I'm interested in, right? Like I'm thinking about like the use, how like you put on a mask, you get to pretend you're someone else. You get to escape 
what's your reality right now. You get to leave yourself for a moment. You get to pretend. Um, I'm thinking, you know, about like avatars, right? Not, not like, you know, not like the blue ones or the airbenders, but like <laughs> you get to be in a video game or like who is like you get to put on this persona, right? It allows you, it's a transformative thing for me, the masks. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I'm also, for me, like, I'm thinking about when I started creating these masks, I'm thinking about like what happens to people when they are also like racialized, right? Like their identity becomes obscured in a way, right? Someone looks at someone and assumes something about them based off of their own like internal thoughts of the world, regardless of the individual. And that's kind of also what happens when you see someone in a mask, you're making assumptions about them. And it's also a reflection of this thing that happens um, where people are hyper visible in spaces, mm -hmm. they're racialized, but then also like easily erased from mm -hmm. history, conversations, or access to spaces. But they're also like hyper visualized. You hyper, you're hyper aware they're there. It's like this weird. Well, it's interesting because I've always kind of thought of masks as like, um, like almost like a form of protection, like an identity you put on yourself to project. But um, what I'm hearing you say is like masks are also something that can be placed on you. You know what I mean? Like you can you can become a proxy for like an entire like group you know and so that's really interesting to think of the mask as not like a protective thing but as a violent thing almost yeah. right well, but i think i think with me the way i'm thinking about the masks are both they can be protected mm -hmm. right? someone's placing these on they are escaping the reality maybe the reality isn't too positive or they just want a new experience or whatever whatever or it's placed onto them mm -hmm. and it's dangerous Right. Yeah. And that's something I think the viewers have to sit with. Yeah. Right. Like, and, you know, they get to come to their own conclusions about like, what's going on here? Are, mm -hmm. you know, are, is this a positive thing? Is this a negative thing? Is it something in between? Mm -hmm. um, I'm really interested in like ambiguity and right. things that aren't clear cut and c convoluted at times. So I think, cause that is, in my opinion, like reality, that is the life we live. Nothing's ever clear. And I right. think we want things to be, they're nice, little yeah. nice, but that's not the way things are. That's just not. Right. Um, so, okay. Um, could you tell me, okay. And I'm harping on the masks, but I, I was curious when I was installing the show, um, they're called, one of them's like uh, Gemini and Venus. Mm -hmm. What what are the Gemini and Mars and then the other ones a jester, I think? Yeah, yeah. So yes, could you so, is there is are they just like named that or is there anything? Oh yeah, no, there's um definitely some research that goes behind it. Like I said, like I'm really interested in fantasy and mythology mm -hmm. and so you know, you have like Gemini, the constellation, right? And it's two ruling planets are um Venus and Mars, right? And Venus and Mars are it within like Roman and Greco mythology are in love. They're brother and sister in, oh. in love, but Venus <laughs> is well that that wasn't a big thing. They didn't care about that. That yeah, wasn't that was fine. She, was, she was already married to her other brother, which is where it was an issue. That's right? where the taboo is, yeah. Yeah, that's not who cares about that. Like no, uh, <laughs> but uh yeah, so she's she's married to her other brother, and the, mm -hmm. but it's not a true love. It's a forced marriage. It's something she didn't mm -hmm. want to do. And her true love was Mars or Aries, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, um, and uh, so I titled them like Venus in Mars, Venus. Sorry, uh, Gemini in Mars, Gemini in Venus, and in parentheses, lovers, because also the lovers card is, is, right, kind of, right. is influenced by Gemini. So like. So interesting. So you have a lot of different um, traditions kind of coming in here. Um, yeah. You talk about like tarot. I think you're talking about, oh, I'm going to feel dumb right now. What, like, what's the specific mythology? Is it Greek mythology? 
Greco Roman, yeah. Oh. yeah. Um, and then, um, of course, I, I mean, like I'm dumb, and I was thinking of like a, like astrology before I thought of anything else. But um, so, what are kind of other types of? Um, I guess I would say like mythologies that influence your work. Um, I would say. And I know I'm like totally. I sent you questions. I said I was going to ask you, and now I'm getting sidetracked. So. No, no, this is yeah. Yeah, no, this is a convo. This is what, how things <laughs> go. Like um, other mythologies, I, I've in terms of mythology, I tend to stick to like Greco-Roman because that they're yeah. culturally specific. I feel comfortable talking about them. They come from my own culture. Yeah. Other, I would say, other fantasies and like. Um, fictions that influence my work is like dungeons and dragons mythos right like i know i keep going back i'm a hyper yeah, nerd right? so like that's a big element in my work um you know i reflect a lot about some of the things i read whether that's game of thrones or lord of the rings or like the inheritance cycle or like Ar aragon is a part of the inheritance cycle right it's like those are things that are part of like my everyday culture here as a person that I bring in or like tarot. Well, it's very interesting or... because I mean, I think and like for me, it's just, I mean, you know what you were saying, but for me, it's just like starting to click is um, that in all of these like fantastical spaces that we use as like spaces of escapism, we still have kind of like more serious IRL powers that find like a way to seep themselves in. Like, I yeah. mean, like, like all Marvel movies just being like US propaganda. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. um, and I mean, yeah, I don't know. So that's really interesting. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back to my normal questions that I had. Um, That's whatever you need. As don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so storytelling is oh wait, I have it typed out. Okay, so storytelling is an overarching theme in your work, and we see it really literally, especially in the hanging tapestries, because they're kind of um, serial. You know, there's like the um, the beginning of the journey, and then the lovers, and the, in the forest. And um, how does storytelling inform your process? I know we're kind of like I'm asking the same question again, but um, yeah, tell me more about the storytelling. Well, you know. Um... Like I said, like I loved as a kid, I loved to read. I read now. Um, and like as I got older, I played Dungeons and Dragons. And currently, like I'm a dungeon master for my group. And for those of you who don't know, the dungeon master is uh, in charge of like leading the story, narrating the events, and like also being like a referee for your players, right? And in itself, that is kind of its own art form. Like storytelling is an art form game design is an art form mm -hmm. um you know and i also love like as i love looking at like illustrations right mm -hmm. like watercolor and like ink like illustrations whether it's like you know and i love all those because with those with illustrations like you get like a scene that's really it. You get like, here's a moment and sometimes you'll get lucky and here's a whole book of them. But like, there's still moments in between the moments we get to see. There are gaps. And I really love that with illustrative storytelling. You don't... Right. Well, story. Illustrative storytelling is an incredible access point, I think. Like, it, it really pays to be literal sometimes on trying to like, hook an audience. Um, but I mean, I also think of like... Um, storytelling as a theme of your work beyond just this literal sense but we're talking about identities and the stories we are told about our own identities or we're mm -hmm. told about other people's identities and i think that's also really central to your work right when, we, when we're coming back to the mask um yeah. um and i guess sorry this is a bit of a departure but i'm really intrigued by this work i'm gonna scroll to it um with the person on fire um, wearing a dress and I could you tell me more about this and kind of like how storytelling informs this piece specifically like is this in reference to anything um, we might know about well um, so these are like actually like self portraits um, and I, I wore this dress on this beach in Crete um, I was helping a, a friend out and he was doing this photo series and 
for me, it was a way, and she was also thinking about this. We were both, we both at the time, like these two paintings and with her work, she was thinking about masculinity. I'm, I was thinking about masculinity. And for me, it was a way to like, how can I challenge my own ideas about masculinity and like cr create something um, healthier and more expansive and um, maybe less toxic or see myself ex existing in like, in a way I don't think I, I can for, so like, I'm also thinking about like soft mask, right? It's like, who has that privilege? of being able to be like, like, yeah, I'm masculine, but like, I'm good. Don't worry. I'm not. Right. Well, I'm being able to like turn it off and stuff. Right. Yeah. Like I, who, what's, who's the actor? Like Timothy, Sharla, whoever's oh, like, yeah. yeah. Him, like, you know, he's showing up to the Grammys or whatever and like mm -hmm. a jacket open, no shirt underneath. Not everyone can do that. Right. That's like, that's the coolest outfit I've ever seen. And like, it's cool because he's a skinny white boy, right? Right, right. It's right. Accepted. Like he's challenging it. It's a like, world. He's allowed to do that. He's he's friendly. It's good. Not everyone, and I include myself in this, is able to walk into a space and people so assume sometimes like the worst, right? Mm -hmm. Broad shoulders, brown skin, man threatening. I don't. I can't be soft mask. As no matter how right. friendly I am. Like how, no matter how much work I do, mm -hmm. it's not a reality. So for me, in this fantastical space, it becomes a reality. Mm -hmm. I, I get, to, but like often, like I said, I'm interested in like the duality. Mm -hmm. um, so in both of these, like I'm still want to own up to things I benefit from. So mm -hmm. I'm on fire. I'm burning. This like, I'm not, I can't, no matter how much, once again, no matter how much work I do, no matter how much I change and try to re-envision and reshape masculinity, there's aspects of it that need to go, that need to burn, mm -hmm. that I am still a part of. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what I'm thinking here. So, you know, I put myself in this dress that I find really pretty. But I don't think I could actually wear that in real life. Like that's the right. reality. So this is my fantastical space. This is me masquerading. This is a part of the avatar, the envisioning of a fictional reality while also still trying to acknowledge certain things. Totally. Well, it's, it's something else that kind of like came up for me while you were talking was, um, um, about like otherness and masks and we're talking about like masks being something placed on you versus and also being things that you can like place on yourself um and I think we're at a point right now where um and I say this I'm, I want to say this as like cautiously as I can but like otherness is something that has become trendy in many ways um and so you see a lot of people um like trying to put otherness on like trying to appear other while they might not be um i guess that's not really like so much a question but it's something that um i thought of when you were talking um mm -hmm. hmm. well yeah so not a question but thought about it okay <laughs> um so to continue talking about like otherness, um, could you elaborate on what you mean when you say that fantasy is used um, to reinforce otherness on people and give me like some specific examples? Um, yeah. I can think of quite a few, but. <laughs> yeah, so off the top of my head, like I go to Tolkien, right? And Lord of the Rings and many mm -hmm. people like consider him he's, like the grandfather of Western fantasy, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. And in his like writings and his notes that have come out, they're published. He's straight up like, I designed and drew and thought about my orcs as, and I was taking their features and the way they looked mm -hmm. from black and Asian folks. Mm -hmm. He didn't use those words. He used words that would be considered slurs today. Mm -hmm. But like, he says that that's published. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? This person that's influenced 
so mm-hmm. many other like fantasy genres mm-hmm. you create his antagonist based off of people in our world mm-hmm. right black being mm-hmm. people what does it mean game of thrones george r r martin right mm-hmm. created like the dornish in the south of westeros based right. on latin culture and like everyone's hypersexual everyone's fetishized what does it mean that the yeah. dark are a group of like typically described as like brown marauding rapists or like who what else um you know it bell hooks wrote about like the incredible hulk you brought up marvel earlier mm-hmm. she was like you know you have this super intelligent white man who's composed all the time and then the moment he loses that composure he's hyper emotional he's angry he's aggressive Mm -hmm. he's massive and he's in a body of color right um i mean you see it also in like queer film history like um in (laughs) what was that our puff girls, uh, him was the art. It was one of the villains. Him and like, right, and yeah, everything was very ambiguous about him and like in terms of gender and sexuality. And he was a villain, and also in a red body. That's a body of color. Like, what does right. that mean for little kids? That right. right. Well, no, and I mean, also you see, like, all Disney villains up until like the early two thousands were all like, um, had an accent. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And um. But then also like in, in queer film history, you see um, in like, in, hold on, let me, so like in the eighties, um, all the like queer coded villains were like, or all queer people that appeared in movies in the eighties were like vampires, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like um, that was like a big one for lesbians. Like all lesbians were vampires. Like they couldn't simply just appear as lesbians. They had to be like a vampire or something of the sort. And then like, um, I mean, I. There's so many more that, but it's escaping me right now, of course. But then also like, um, it's interesting because all, like a lot of times in like between the twenties and fifties in film history, you see a lot of um, foreigner and queer person as being interchangeable. Um, And like, these were never positive depictions, right? They were uh, like deeply based in stereotype um, and really harmful. Um, So you see, yeah, like, two very different types of otherness, but used interchangeably to like feed the, um, to feed the stereotypes about each other. So, um, yeah. Damn. Yeah, that's like within like, a lot of people I think wanna like use these, use fantasy as a way to like be like no 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 it's it's all fake it's not real you know mm-hmm. like it doesn't like no 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 it's within every part of our history mm-hmm. right like it doesn't we we can't escape it we can't just like say it doesn't exist here either so like it's something i like to think about within my work and i try to bring it in and address it to the, you know the best of my abilities um so um so this is something else i was interested in bringing up and it's another kind of like sensitive topic but um you talk i think i remember in your artist statement you talk about um well your family's from italy right yeah okay and you talk about um an ethnic minority in italy Mm mm-hmm Did I make that up? Um, And I think something that I've noticed is like many conversations on the internet, they lack nuance. And I think that um, stories about, and I I say this like so lightly, because like, anyway, (laughs) um, stories about colonialism really lack nuance. And I think um, obviously like colonialism bad um but um i think like putting like whiteness as a monolith over europe i don't know if i use that word right is kind of like harmful and reductive um and also just like ignoring like massively ignoring large chunks of history Mm -hmm. um 
where like, I mean, there's like the classic, well, whatever. But so, can you speak to that? Like, like, can you tell me a little more about like ethnic minorities in Italy? Is what I guess I'm going for. Um, well, I, I, I think like the 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 classic meme that goes around, which is very funny, and obviously like comes from somewhere where it's just like, oh, Italian people, like, oh, I'm not white, I'm Italian, right? And like that, like really, like there are like really like white Italians who like firmly believe that say they're that. not white simply yes, because they're they Italian. say that with confidence, yes. Yeah, like that <laughs> comes from somewhere. So like I'm not like be clear, like I'm not talking about that. Like you know what I mean? And like yes, like um, there. Are, predominantly white Europeans, you know, but like, so yeah, but there are, again, like these caveats, these like, um, these like more nuanced spaces where, so yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, well, I could, I could speak about it to a degree to clarify. I'm not from Italy. Like mm -hmm. my grandparents mm -hmm. and my dad is right. And like on my mom's side, they're all Italian American. Right. So that, which is different. Let me just also, I don't know if I want to clarify being Italian American and being Italian are different. Um, yeah, they are different cultures. Yeah. But yeah, in the um, south of Italy, uh, mm -hmm. in the uh, province of Calabria, which mm -hmm. is like Italy's a boot kicking Sicily the soccer ball, Calabria is the toe. Okay. Um, they, for a long time, were. Um, like an ethnic minority, it's been they've been kicked out of the country numerous times, right? Mm -hmm. um, because most the majority of people down there were mixed, they were black, they were brown, they're also white people down there, right? Mm -hmm. It's like it wasn't so clear cut as like the narrative wants it to be. Mm -hmm. There wasn't this like purely white race on the italian peninsula it it, it, does, it still doesn't exist right right um and like mo many of them were kicked out and the, some of the places they found themselves were in the u.s right yeah. um so you would get italians who were white and were black and were brown and were mixed right mm -hmm in the US and redlining was a thing. So white Italians lived with white Italians and mm -hmm. black, brown and mixed Italians lived with black, brown, mixed Italians, mm -hmm. right? World War II happens, the white ones get to go to war and the black, brown and mixed ones get to put, get put in camps with Japanese Americans, mm -hmm. right? And that's where the idea is, I'm not, Ita I'm not white, I'm Italian comes from. Right, right. Right, and it's, it's from- So it's like a, it's like a something that has and, and this is interesting because like i didn't intend to talk about memes but it's like this is like how um i mean like i personally know a white italian who's like i'm not white i'm italian so like yeah like fuck that right but like, yeah, like, yeah, like again like I'm related to <laughs> what was that i'm related to many of them yeah <laughs> right like it's, it exists so like i, I really i just want to be like hyper clear that i'm not trying to go down that path but i just like like if an opportunity arises for me to call for nuance, I will do that. So yeah, thank you I, for telling. I actually didn't um, know that at all until I uh, saw your work. So yeah, um, it's like there, we we operate on this idea of cultural purity, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? That's how the U.S. operates. It's like everyone from this culture is this thing, and that's how it fits into our boxes. Mm -hmm. People have been migrating from landmass to landmass for a very very long time and they don't give a fuck about the imaginary borders that constantly get redrawn <laughs> that's well, so when you decide that something is like native right because like um like like white spanish people as colonizers is like a real thing but like before spain was like white and catholic it was like there were like many iterations before that but it's like i think we have like very like we're very narrow-minded when we did when we talk about um mm. let me like put it this way so like when does let's talk about like plants or or yeah. birds right you know like the common sparrow that you see in, everywhere in the united states that is everywhere like mm -hmm. the ones that you like that are like next to you on the ground when you're trying to like eat a sandwich in peace right um 
those are an invasive species. Like they're not from here, but they've been here for as long as we can remember and as long as our parents can remember and possibly our grandparents can remember, right? So it's like, when do you begin, when does something become like of that space? And I guess like this is, all of this is just to say that I think sometimes when we talk about these things, like our like site of history falls really short. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like I think it's just one, we live in the top age of the internet. Everything needs to be quick. Right. right? We're, we don't have time to talk about the nuances and how complex everything is and how mm -hmm. there are people all over the world that range and mm -hmm. they exist in all different cultures, right? It's like no such thing as cultural purity in, mm -hmm. in terms of like race. It's like, that's a thing. It, it's, I, I don't like, like you're talking about Spain, like everyone thinks about like Spain and like there are white Spanish and they colonize, but there were also, there are to this day people who are Spanish living in Spain who are black. Right. They're not any less Spanish than the white person in Spain. Right. It's like right. that's their culture and everyone is, has a right to partake in a culture there a part of and i'm not talking about cultural appropriation or like saying that like and and sometimes i see like um i've seen people be like oh i'm more this than this other person and oftentimes it's like because i mean i don't know i don't even know what i'm saying but yeah it's yeah it's it all comes from this like idea of purity that is just like completely non-existent and 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 like when you're talking about like um um IRL big problems of like colonialism, racism that are now like seeping into fantasy, even in these like idealist leftist leftist worlds we like to like exist in, like those things still seep into it. Like these ideas of like purity, um, mm -hmm. which are really harmful. Um, yeah. So yeah. It's interesting. We all kind of like act like cops when it comes to like identity. And that's like really problematic. Um, yeah, and, yeah. Um, <laughs> and we shouldn't. And I think we just have to, like, you know, to a degree, like, there are, like, I don't know, maybe this is really conservative of me, but I don't believe in, like, transracial surgery that's happening. <laughs> like, maybe. That is not very conservative of you because that is, like, <laughs> literally bonkers. <laughs> like, people are, like, you know, that, we're that's talking about, like, other being... lines that get drawn, right? It's like. Well, this is what we're talking about, like, identity being, um, like, trendy. You have, like, Rachel Dolezal, a white woman who's, like, I am now black. And it's like, you can't just, like, put that on. No, um, it doesn't <laughs> work like that. It doesn't. But yeah. No, you know. Um, I'm gonna tell people right now. So I have one question left for Francesco, but um, if you guys have questions, type them in the chat now because there's like a 30 second lag for us. So we'll get to them after this next question I have. Um, ask away. Um, okay, and then my last question for you. Sorry, we're like going back now. Um, mm -hmm. Did I cut you off at any point? Did I? I don't Maybe? think so. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> so. Back to um, Bug World. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how bringing? So um, Francesco gave me some black and white line drawings, and we decided together to make them tapestries that could hang. We were thinking about how um, we could create something that didn't exist IRL and put it in this online space. Um, and so we thought it would be like really lovely to hang some of his drawings on these uh, tapestries that you would have to walk through to see the work. Um, so Francesco, can you tell me how bringing your work into the 3D space like changed it and maybe changed how you looked at it? Yeah, so what I really like about the masks existing in IRL and within the paintings is like they act as Easter eggs, right? Mm -hmm. It's like I envision one day like having an exhibition where you're like, you're looking at these paintings and drawings and you're seeing the figures and the mask and then you go, Oh wait, that mask is right there. Mm -hmm. And making the connection like, Oh, maybe this 
2D fictional space that I could potentially exist in mm -hmm. is a place I can actually exist in because that mm -hmm. exists in it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If I put that on, which I can, it is a mask. Mm -hmm. Am I now actually a part of this conversation? Right. Um, well, I'm having like a like a a 3D like wearable object in yeah. this like well, it's a 3D online space but like to us it's yes. 2d you know what i mean like yeah it's yeah yeah uh but that that's kind of how i'm thinking about the mask is they they go like is a way for me to have the have viewers not only think about like oh i could i can potentially exist with this 2d thing right because at the mm -hmm. end of the day two drawings paintings it's all illusionary space. Mm -hmm. They now, the viewers now with the masks have to confront the reality that these things exist in the space with them. Mm -hmm. They are with the space, they, they are with each other, they exist in the same space, they understand the relationship, the physical relationship, the scale in a different way, right? It's, I think it just really has people questioning um, you know, uh, just really questioning what's happening in, in, in the 2D works differently. I think that's how I view them. That's my intention with them. Um, yeah. Well, something I was really excited about um, in showing your work is um, obviously like 3D virtual spaces have existed for a very long time, but I think a lot of people haven't used them. I certainly hadn't, you know what I mean? Like I'd use like Sims, but not like anything like this. And um, when Sammy, who started New Art City, um, showed me like the first New Art City, <laughs> New, Art City New Art City show that I saw, um, I was like totally blown away. Like I hadn't like navigated a space like this. And I, I think like I've seen, virtual spaces that are like so like 3D and futuresque. And then I've seen ones that are really just like trying as hard as they can to replicate IRL spaces. Um, and so what I was interested in doing is for this first show kind of finding this middle ground, like having it replicate an IRL space so that people who haven't seen spaces like this before can be like, aha, uh -huh, yes, this is like the museum that I've gone to. I mean, so having like 2D work like yours, um, like physically, like, you know, on a wall um, to create that like bridge for people. But then um, also having these moments where it's like, okay, well, like the painting I see, I'm like, I know that this painting exists in real life, but the tapestry is like a 3D rendering, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the tapestry is kind of this, like this doesn't exist, but I understand what the real life proxy would be, right? Um, and so I think that that moment for me in the group show was really important because, um, I think it like really bridges that gap. And then you have like Bun's piece, which is the poem, which could not possibly exist in real life. You know what I mean? Um, and so I, I really do see like the tapestries and the masks being somewhere between real life and virtual. Um, yeah, like, yeah, they just bridge that gap for me and it, it's really mm -hmm. exciting. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I really like that the tapestries only exist in Bug World, right? Yeah, hell like, yeah. But one day they all exist IRL. I would love that, I hope that happens sometime soon especially because i'm not done with this series i'm not done you know showing the lover's journey and all the things that they're going to get up to together and you know <laughs> their well, hardships it, and triumph printing, you can print on organza for pretty cheap so you should look into that but that's like organza we'll about that later yeah organza is like the, it's like a really cheap like sheen see-through fabric that's like really beautiful yeah. and I know that you can like order these online because I've had friends who've done it before. But anyway, um, let's. I don't think there's any questions. Let's check. No questions. It's okay, guys. I'm also scared of asking questions in these things. But um, was there anything else you wanted to say um, before we log off? No. No. Um, okay. If you if you don't already, I don't know how many people are viewing, but uh, you can find me at a. Uh on Instagram at uh, Francesco underscore Gattuso underscore art. <laughs> yes, um, you, know, you can 
find him. Um, I've linked him in my story, so follow him there. His work again is like, as you can see, very beautiful. Okay, so we're good. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for coming to uh, listen. To me ramble. <laughs> thank you guys. Bye. <laughs>